Starting off this countdown, we have Yama. In Hinduism, Buddhism, and Shinto, Yama is known as the King of Hell. Some depictions of him show him with green skin, multiple arms, dressed in red clothing, and donning a shiny crown with a flower in it. He is often seen riding a buffalo. He is also often shown carrying a noose, which he uses to catch people with. So in Buddhism, he is the judge of the dead. He determines the fate of every soul, whether they go to heaven or to one of the eight levels of hell. He is considered to be cruel and vicious, but don't worry, he's a fair judge and only punishes the truly wicked. Coming in at number nine, we have Miklanta Kutli. And if you guys are liking this video so far, then make sure to give it a big thumbs up. Translated, his name literally means Lord of Miklan. Miklan being the Aztec underworld or land of the dead. It was also named the place of the fleshless. Great. So this guy was depicted as a skeleton or just covered in bones. He was also covered in red spots, which represents blood. Or some depictions show him wearing a skull mask with bones shoved into his ears. Around his neck, he would wear a necklace of human eyes. Sometimes he is also depicted with having an open liver because the liver was thought to be the place where the soul resided. This guy was highly feared. I mean, he literally devoured the dead, which is why the Aztecs got into human sacrifice. They thought if they sacrificed a living soul to this god, then he would spare some of their dead relatives, at least until he became hungry again. Moving on to number eight, we have Satan. Satan, the devil, Lucifer. This man goes by a variety of names and he is feared by many. So Satan used to be an angel called Lucifer. Apparently Lucifer was so obsessed with his own beauty and intelligence that he decided to stage an uprising against God. In the end, this led him to getting banished to the depths of hell along with other sinners. Now this guy is extremely powerful. He's got armies of demons at his fingertips and he is known to be a cunning liar. Here's an excerpt and I quote, he was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. John 844. Coming in at number seven, we have Lo Vietar. In Finnish mythology, Lo Vietar is the goddess of death, pain, and disease. Here's a nice little quote from a poem that describes just how lovely she is. Old and wicked witch, Worst of all, the Deathland woman, ugliest of mana's children, source of all the host of evils, all the ills and plagues of Northland. Now it continues on saying that she has the blackest of hearts. She also gave birth to nine sons that carried a bunch of illnesses like cancer, the plague, consumptions, gout, ulcers, and rickets. To make matters worse, she is said to be the master of inflicting physical and psychological pain on people. Doesn't she just sound like a peach? And uh, speaking of peaches, make sure you guys subscribe to my new channel, Peach. Link in bio. Moving on to number six, we have Susano. According to Shinto text, Susano is the god of the underworld. After offending the creator god and his sister, the sun goddess, they banished him to the underworld. Now, this dude was an extremely vile god, especially towards his family. Take this story, for example. So his son, Okanushi, came to the underworld to marry his half-sister. Suzanu made him do a bunch of tasks first before letting this happen, like locking him in a pit of snakes, and then also locking him in a room full of wasps, or setting a room on fire with him inside. You know, thing usual. If you thought that was bad though, wait until you hear this. Apparently, he had this ongoing rivalry with his sister. One time, he destroyed her rice fields, threw a dead pony at her, and then killed one of her assistants in anger. So next time you complain about your siblings, just be grateful that you don't have this guy as your brother. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with Hell. In Norse mythology, Hell is the goddess of the underworld slash the deity of death. In fact, her name, most likely influenced the English word for hell. So hell was regarded by the Vikings as the person in charge of those who died, but only those who died from illness or old age. The people that died in battle went to Valhalla to join Odin and the other gods, but apparently she has more power than Odin. So hell is often depicted as having one side of her body being alive and the other half being dead. That's why the Vikings feared her appearance so much. I mean, one side, she literally looks like a decaying corpse. 
She's also considered to be quite greedy and cruel. When she was born into this world, disease also came into this world. She would then go through towns bringing with her a plague, wiping out almost everyone. Fun fact, the expression go to hell was originally used to tell people to go to hell, the goddess of death, not the fiery depths of hell. In our fourth spot, we have Lilith. Lilith is a female demon in Jewish folklore. Some texts say that Lilith was the first wife of Adam, but she wasn't that obedient to him, and Adam didn't like that, so Lilith left. Then God made Eve, who was way more obedient. Lilith became jealous and turned into the snake that made Eve take a bite from the apple, you know. The two were then banished from the Garden of Eden, and Lilith turned into a demon. Her main goal, to get revenge on all men. Lilith also apparently wasn't able to conceive, so she was jealous of pregnant women and would come for them and their babies. Don't worry though, she took an oath, so she's not allowed to hurt any children. But still, this woman is pretty fearsome. In our third spot, we have Hades. And if you guys love Greek mythology like me, then hit that like button. Also, if you've seen the movie Piercy Jackson, then also hit that like button. Hades is known in Greek mythology as the ruler of the underworld and the god of death. Hades, along with his brothers Zeus and Poseidon, ended up defeating their father. As a result, the three had to split up their role. Zeus became the god of the skies, Poseidon became the god of the seas, and Hades got the worst out of the three. He became the god of the underworld. That right there made him sour and envy his brothers. As the ruler of the underworld, he is the keeper of souls. If a soul tried to leave, then Hades would punish them. If someone tried to rescue a soul in the underworld, Hades would also try and punish them. One example would be the story of Pirathus. Basically, Hades tricked a woman named Persephone to live in the underworld with him forever. Legend goes that if you eat the food of the dead, then you are forever bound to the underworld and you can't leave. Well, he tricked Persephone into eating a pomegranate seed and uh, she got stuck down there with him against her will. So Pirathus tries to be a hero and come rescue her, but it fails and Hades sent him to the Chair of Forgetfulness, where his memory was completely wiped. He now has a blank mind for all of eternity. And at number two, we have Cerberus. How can I talk about Hades without talking about Cerberus, his gigantic three-headed dog that guards the gates of Hades? In Greek mythology, Cerberus is described as being a vicious dog-like beast. His eyes are blood red and he's got massive paws that can tear deeply into the human flesh. To make it even worse, in some depictions, he's got a serpent for a tail and a mane of snakes. Now, Cerberus is tasked with a very important job. He has to make sure that no one leaves the underworld. Any mortal that tries to enter the underworld will be killed and eaten. Man, that's rough. Get it? Like rough, like cause he's a cause he's a dog. Never mind. <laughs> And in our number one spot, we have Kali. In Hindu mythology, Kali is the deity of death, doomsday, violence, and a whole bunch of other things. She is highly feared and her appearance is one of the reasons why. She is often depicted as having dark blue skin with a long blood red tongue sticking out of her mouth. That's not the scary part, no, no. The scary part is that she is often seen holding a decapitated bloody head and a sword. The skirt she wears is made out of ripped out arms of her enemies. And she wears a necklace of people's heads around her neck and she wears children as earrings. But she isn't all bad. I mean, she has saved the world from demons a couple of times, so that's good. Now, how did she come to be this powerful deity? Well, according to one legend, she jumped down her husband's throat, merged with a pool of poison that was inside of him, and then when she came out, Voila, she was the death goddess. Starting off with number 10 is Kali. Now Kali is a Hindu goddess who was first known as the destroyer of evil forces and is also the goddess of destruction, power, time and creation. Many tantric sects worship her as the mother of the universe or the divine mother. So you'd assume she's all angelic and only doing just things and that's totally not true. She's the wife or mistress of the god Shiva who's a lot calmer and obedient than her in comparison basically I'd say he's the whipped one. Kali is known for her extremely violent outbursts and is almost always depicted standing on top of Shiva or trampling all over him while wearing a skirt of severed heads and human 
arms. Shiva, happy wife, happy life, my friend, live by it. In one of her most famous portraits, she's standing on Shiva with one leg, holding the severed head of someone with one arm, a plate under that to catch the blood with her other arm, and her two arms on the other side are carrying weapons. Oh, yeah, and a necklace of severed heads and a skirt of arms. Love it. The biggest legend about her involves her killing the demon Raktabiza, who can reproduce from one drop of his own blood. So you can guess he's pretty freaking hard to kill, believe me, we tried. So after humans failed, they called on Kali, who drank his blood, then ate him and all his clones. She followed that by dancing maniacally on all the dead bodies and on Shiva. I feel like Shiva wasn't even involved, but she just wanted to be on top of him anyway. <laughs> Coming in at number nine is Hell. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Hell was from Norse mythology and she was the goddess of the underworld Helheim. As you probably guessed, her name was used for inspiration for the word of hell today. She was in charge of those who died due to old age or sickness because people who died in battle went to Valhalla instead. Interestingly enough, she's the daughter of Loki and one of her siblings is a serpent that's wrapped around the world called Jormungand. And looks wise, it's a lot. Half her body is alive whilst the other is dead and it's said she brought disease into the world the moment she was born. She's seen as extremely greedy and used to sweep through towns just killing everybody. For what reason? Beats me. We just have the half dead female version of Hades over here who kills people as a hobby. Miss me with that. At number 8 we have Kernabog and I know I'm saying that wrong but it's hard when there's no vowels in between the letters. Anyway, he was a Slavic god whose name literally means black god and he's mostly seen as a demon monster with a horrific appearance. The dark master as he was called was the god of chaos, night, winter and misfortune, all the things I hate in the world. He came into power with the winter solstice when the night was the longest and his job later became to generate all the evils around the world. A lot of people still worshipped him regardless of what he provided because they thought these inconveniences were just part of life. I mean, I think they also worshipped him because he was frightening and he was, you know, known as the evil god. He was the dark, evil counterpart of the good deity Belobog, the white god who was in charge of the sun and light. There's not a lot of information about him, so it's hard to say much about him, even looks wise. There's no descriptions anywhere, but I kind of let my imagination run wild with that one, and that was a mistake. Filling our number seven slot is Chinna Master. She is the Hindu goddess of contradictions, which doesn't doesn't seem all that scary, but just wait for it. She represents death, immortality, destruction, as well as life. Almost all the stories about her center on her self sacrifice and sexuality. She cut off her own head and liked dancing around with it while blood spurted from her neck. To top it all off, she lets her attendants drink her spurting blood. So, I mean, I guess that's nice of her. There are many stories surrounding why she cut off her head. Apparently, a bunch of Hindu gods and demons extracted an immortality elixir from the ocean and she drank all the demons' shares of it. She then quickly decapitated herself so they couldn't take it back from her. Weird flex, but okay. I feel like a lot of other things could have been done to prevent them from taking it back before, you know, resorting to decapitating yourself. But she's also a goddess, so she can do whatever the hell she wants. So there's that. I personally won't be drinking out of her neck, but if she was in front of me, I'd probably do it out of sheer fear. And if you paid me, a lump sum of money to do it, I would. Now at number six is Aphrodite. Surprisingly, when I learned about her in school, I never saw her as a scary god. I just thought she was sweet. I mean, hello, she's the goddess of beauty, love, and sexuality. There's nothing, nothing really scary about that. I mean, no, no, love can be scary. That is a thing. Let's be warned. Now her origins are a bit contested. According to Homer's Iliad, she's Zeus and Dion's daughter, but other sources say she came from Cronus castrating Uranus and throwing his genitals into the sea. And then, you know, she came from the sea from his genitals. She made Zeus hella worried with her sexual freedom, so he tried to tame her a bit by making her marry Hephaestus. Sadly, Hephaestus was ugly as hell, so our girl was not happy about it, so she cheated on him quite a bit. She happily rewarded those who honored her, but her vanity made her viciously cruel to those who didn't. There was an incident where the women on the island of Lemnos refused to sacrifice to her, so she cursed them with a major body odor so their husbands would never have sex with them again. In the tragedy, Hippolytus, Hippolytus only worships the god of virginity and Aphrodite is furious at this so she makes his stepmom Freyda fall in love with him knowing he'll reject her. After she gets rejected she commits suicide claiming Hippolytus tried to rape her and of course her husband banishes Hippolytus and prays Poseidon kills him. And he does. 
plot twist. Coming in at number 5 is Menhit. She was a Nubian war goddess in Egyptian mythology and her name literally means she who massacres the slaughterer and the one who sacrifices. She had aggression and murdery tendencies which she noticed isn't ideal. Looks wise she has the head of a lion so she also possesses all the hunting methods and aggressiveness of an actual lioness. In times of conflict she would actually advance in front of the Egyptian army and cut down their opponents. And honestly I don't want to mess with a goddess who is fiercer than an entire army, my odds would just be very low against her. She was also shown as the wife of other war gods like Anher and Menthu so this woman can hold her own and then some. I'd like to have her on my side for things honestly, it's always good to have a Nubian war goddess on your side in times of peril, you know like when your debit card gets rejected trying to buy pizza. Massive issue. Need Menhit for that. At number four is Inanna or Ishtar. She was an ancient Mesopotamian goddess who was known for war, desire, justice, beauty, sex, etc. She was actually known as the Queen of Heaven and was married to the god Dumuzid. The thing about her, she's not only horrible to her lovers, she was a snake to all the other gods as well. She was known for taking over the domains of other gods, like, I mean, she stole mess, which is all the good and bad of civilization, from the god of wisdom. And surely the god of wisdom can be trusted with that but no no not according to Inanna. Now let's explore her sexual encounters. While sleeping under a poplar tree she got raped by a gardener and in a fit of uncontrollable rage she turned all the rivers in the world to blood, she covered the planet with storms and spread disease throughout the populations. She eventually found the man and killed him but not before making hell on earth. One of her previous lovers was an alalu bird whose wing she broke, another was a horse who she consigned to being whipped, one was a gardener who she turned into a dwarf, I don't even know why, she just, she just not on good terms with any ex really. Even when she got killed in the underworld she sacrificed her husband in exchange for her so she could live again. Why you may ask? Because she thought he didn't mourn her enough when she died the first time. I mean a woman scorned is bad enough but a goddess scorned? Forget about it. Down to the underworld you go. <laughs> Filling our number 3 slot is Adro and he is a very interesting and I'm not just saying that because I'm hosting this video, it's true. He's the god of the Lugbara people in central Africa and Adro is one part of a supreme god, the evil part whereas Adroa is the good part of the god. Where Adroa is the god in the sky, Adro is the god on earth. Since both of them make a whole they each have half bodies so one arm, one eye, one ear, you get the gist. Adroa is tall, white, almost translucent whereas Adro is short and coal black. He was the only god that could come into contact with humans despite being invisible most of the time. He can appear in any form, he can even appear as Adroa if he wanted to. He possesses women making them do bad things, he causes death and illness and he abducts people and feasts on them in front of one another. Imagine watching someone get eaten knowing that's going to be you in like 5 minutes. His children are called the Adroanzi and they are basically spirits who guard the dead and they pretty much look like snakes. They follow people at night and if you look back and manage to look at one it'll kill you instantly. So not only is Adro not to be messed with, his kids will screw you up as well. This man has an army. Now at number 2 is Apep. He was the Egyptian god of chaos. Since Ra was the god of light and truth, Apep was his biggest enemy. He's always been depicted looks wise as a giant serpent said to be 16 yards long and have a head made of flint and because of this appearance he was often called the serpent from the Nile. Apep wasn't just born like all the other gods, he actually came to be from Ra's umbilical cord so really his creation was one of the consequences of Ra's birth. He was part of the underworld and would lurk before dawn just waiting for Ra or trying to get him. Other sources claim Apep wasn't from the underworld at all, he was just trapped there by Ra or that he was imprisoned there for being evil. His one only aim in life is to engulf the world in the utmost darkness by killing and eating Ra and every single sun related deity. So we have a revenge thirsty snake god on our hands that will stop at nothing to destroy the god that's bringing light and truth to our lives. Gotta love drama. And finally, at number one is Cronus. This may have been a bit of a mainstream choice, I know, for number one, but it's justified. Youngest of the first generation of Titans, Cronus overthrew his own father Uranus because he was jealous of his power, and then he was later overthrown by his own son Zeus. Karma takes no prisoners, people, not even for gods. Looks wise, he's almost always depicted with a harp or scythe because that's what he uses to castrate others with, namely his dad. Remember when I said genitals were thrown? into the sea to create Aphrodite. 
That was Uranus's genitals. Cronus's mother Gaia told him he was going to be overthrown by his own sons, so he fathered five kids, including Hera, Poseidon, and Hades, and actually ate them so the prophecy wouldn't come true. When Zeus was finally born, his wife Rhea got Gaia's help to protect him, so she had him somewhere in Crete, and he was raised by a goat. I don't know if the goat did a good job or not, honestly. He was good and bad. Even though his title isn't menacing or anything like that, he's a patron of the harvest, but any god that eats his own kids to stay in power should evoke widespread fear in everyone, I reckon. Do we agree? At number 10, we have a siren head. If you are lost in a rural area, keep an eye out. You could be the target of a murderous siren head. It is 40 feet tall, as tall as a telephone pole, with dried and mummified skin. It is said to stalk and murder its victims as it roams around graveyards, woods, and rural towns. Its targets are usually lost travelers, people out for a hike, and sometimes even children. To lure victims towards it, it uses powers to mimic. Just like its name, it can mimic sirens, but also news broadcasts and even people's conversations. The siren head can use sounds of a conversation between a victim's loved ones to bring in their prey. If you get close, you probably won't be able to get away, as it can run up to 240 miles per hour. That's faster than any car I've ever had. And also, to hide from hunting eyes, it can shapeshift into a tree or a tall pole. So the first sighting of the siren had happened in 1966. A family was on vacation in Arizona and took a photo on a Polaroid. It says Arizona Desert Family Vacation 1966 and that's written on the back of the photo. But let's move on to number 9, a skinwalker. This creature is from Navajo folklore. They often get mistaken for werewolves but are much, much worse. They can shapeshift into almost any animal and wear the skin of the animal they turn into. That element of wearing the skin is where their name comes from. In addition to this, they can mimic the sound of any animal or human and are said to even be able to take a hold of you. If you make direct eye contact with a skinwalker, they can put their essence into your body and control it. And you just don't know what's going on. Does no. So for a person to transform into a skinwalker, they kill a close family member. Once they transform, they gain stamina, strength, and speed. They are another incredibly fast creature with a running speed of up to 200 miles per hour, still faster than any car I've ever had. So when they wear the skin of an animal, it's especially creepy because many people share stories of encountering what they think are wild animals. But then the animals run away on their back two legs as if they are possessed by something else. A skinwalker. At number 8, we have a skunk ape, aka Florida's foot. So these creatures were first seen in Dave County, Florida in the 60s and 70s. They are said to roam in whole packs through Florida's Everglade forests. And they run upright on two legs. They are an unknown species of ape that have black fur and glowing red eyes. Their namesake comes from the foul smell the creature gives off. Some people say the smell is like if you would mix the smell of a skunk and a wet dog together. Mm, not good. But there is even an official skunk ape headquarters in Okopee, Florida, and it houses attractions and merchandise. Part of it even houses the stories of Dave Sheely, a man who tried to hunt the skunk ape for 30 years. He tried to get it recognized and documented as a species to no avail. There are still rumors that the skunk ape may have a taste for the meat of humans, since people disappear in South Florida swamps every now and again. Is it the swamp or is it the skunk ape? But another creature, number seven, the Wendigo. So the Wendigo, or sometimes pronounced Wendigo, has been talked about as having the power to curse humans by possessing them. This leads to the rough translation of Wendigo as the evil spirit that devours mankind. It stems from indigenous folklore, and the Wendigo is a cannibalistic creature that would strike during cold winters when food would run short and an intense hunger would take over. Wendigo are now described as a creature with a hunger that can't be satisfied, as it takes to continuously stalking the woods for hunters and travelers. While their thirst for blood can't be stopped, however much they eat doesn't change their physical form. They are extremely thin to the point that their skeleton nearly pierces through their skin. They smell like death and decay because if one finds you, that's what's likely to become of you. At number 6, the Chupacabra. So this creature was first recorded in March of 1995. Ever since then, it has been reported all over the Americas. It's mainly been reported in southwestern United States, Mexico, Mexico and Puerto Rico. Its direct Spanish translation is the goat sucker. This is from its reputation for feeding on livestock by draining their blood. Kind of vampiric if you ask me. So a chupacabra is the size of a small bear, but people say it could be some sort of ape. A definitive trait of its looks is the row of spines that protrudes from its neck to the base of the tail. Other hypotheses of where it comes from are that it is an extraterrestrial, an unknown species of reptile, or a surviving dinosaur. Whatever it is, I don't want to cross its path whenever it's feeling particularly hungry. I like my blood in my body. At number five, Nearlethotep. 
So this creature is a monster that appears in the works of H.P. Lovecraft as well as Auguster Leth. He is one of the cosmic outer gods. You wouldn't want to run into this bad boy since he can shapeshift into over a thousand different forms. When Nier Lethotep puts on a human guise, it's usually an Egyptian pharaoh, but it could be others. As a smooth talker that uses propaganda, he amasses followers really easily. The followers then lose a sense of the world around them and are used to achieve this monster's cruel goals. He is deceptive and manipulative, and definitely a foe you do not want to face. At number 4, a Demogorgon. So you must admit that the Demogorgon that was featured in Stranger Things is not something you ever want to come across. Even in mythology, a Demogorgon is a god or demon associated with the underworld. Its name is even taboo. The other names it is referred to are the monster and man with no face. In Stranger Things, we see the monster as a thin humanoid creature. Its limbs are elongated and the arms end in claws. The skin is slimy and don't get me started on its face. It appears featureless at first, but when it opens its full face mouth, you can see rows and rows of teeth. The abilities of a Demogorgon in mythology include interdimensional travel, strength, telekinesis, blood detection, regenerative healing, and durability. At number 3, the Delahan. So, the Delahan is the Irish headless horseman, also called Gon Kion. It's also called Gon Kion, which also means without a head in Irish. He is said to have lost his head from it being blown off by a cannon, but it's never too far from him. He carries it by his side in his arm. Its head isn't even useless because it's said to have supernatural sight. The Delahan can lift his head up in the darkness of night and see into the houses of those who are dying. He rides on his horse using a spine as a whip, and only when he stops is someone doomed to die. He takes the souls of those ready for death by saying their name aloud. The person named immediately dies. Had to include an Irish one because represent. Yeah. At number two, the Slipmouth Woman, aka Kuchisikana. She got the cut on her face from her husband who slashed her face with a sword. So now she goes after others with scissors. The Slipmouth Woman comes when you aren't expecting her. She will come find you and ask you a question. And you better hope you know the right answer, or can give the right one if there is one. She is said to wait in the shadows until you cross her path, and she will appear in front of you as a woman wearing a surgical mask. But that is just there to hide what is behind it. She will ask you, am I pretty? And you won't even have enough time to answer before she lowers the mask. Beneath it is her mouth that has been slashed into a disturbingly large grin that exposes her teeth and tongue. She will ask another question, am I pretty now? And this is where you have to measure your reaction. If you say yes or scream, she will cut your face to match hers. But if you say no, it could be worse. If you say no, she will let you walk away, but she will be watching you, following you home until you think you are safe asleep and then she will kill you. Mm -hmm. So maybe you could try to run, but she is quick and may just kill you for it. Is there a solution? Seems like not, unfortunately. But let's move on to number one, Slenderman. The Slenderman is an urban legend and mythical entity that lives out in the woods. He is very tall with long and slender arms and legs. Some have said that he wears a suit and tie while others say he is more of a tree-like figure with tentacles up to 12 feet long. Either way, he is a being to be feared. His typical targets are children and he has been photographed lurking behind large groups of them. After abducting children, he leaves notes. Those who speak about the Slender Man in a suit say he used to be a normal person before he became something else. With willowy proportions, he appears to float, indicating he may be ethereal now. Whatever powers he has, he uses, as he uses his outstretched arms to put victims into a hypnotized state. Once they are helpless and under his control, he has his victims walk into him, and who knows what happens to them when they are in there. And I, I sure don't want to find out. 